All right, well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies, a podcast dedicated to exploring thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is another interview, and this time we'll be interviewing Dr. Jerry Root. Dr. Jerry Root is a professor of evangelism and the director of the Evangelism Initiative at Wheaton College. He's been on staff there since 1996. He's an accomplished author, C.S. Lewis scholar, and perhaps responsible for more babies being born in the Wheaton area than anyone else in history. Jerry's been a personal mentor. Verify that or it'll sound bad. <laughs> I know, we will, we will. Jerry is a, uh, he's been a personal mentor of mine since 2017, a trusted friend and confident, confidant. Uh, I once heard a speaker introduce Jerry by saying that he's already learned and forgotten more about C.S. Lewis than most of us will learn in our whole life, but I'm, I'm actually not so sure Jerry's forgotten anything from his time studying Lewis, uh, which is a contention that we made clear in this interview. So Jerry, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Parker. Thanks for your friendship over the years, too. I'm grateful. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Jerry's like the godfather of, of Wheaton, Illinois, and I say that because he's responsible for all these babies being born through his uh, massive numbers of uh, premarital counseling with, and, and even performing lots of weddings. Jerry, any, any idea how many premarital counseling sessions you've done? Well, I lost track on the weddings I've done after 900. I've done over 900 <laughs> weddings. And I've done premarital counseling for at least 600 couples. Wow. So I didn't do. So that's 3,000 people. That's insane. That's a lot of babies. I don't, th I don't think I even teach a class at Wheaton where I don't have at least one student whose parents I married. I, always, <laughs> I feel responsible for you being here. That's right. Well, Wheaton should, should give you a bonus for producing uh, so many of their students. Yeah, no, it's future. It's it's keeping the college open with all those tuition dollars that keep. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Jerry also calls himself uh, Forrest Gump because he's got this wild life where he's he's witness to Ronald Reagan and Ronald Reagan's assistants. And Jerry, weren't you there for the the Berkeley free speech riots? Uh, I wasn't at. I, I was at Berkeley during that time several times. But we used to go to riots all the time and protests and witness to people. Yeah, I saw a lot of people come to Jesus during those days too. Wow, yeah. There, what was the the one where um, the students went in and they were talking with the administration and the administration said you guys got to keep calm and they couldn't keep calm and they kicked them out and then they said, do you remember that one? The students were crazy. That the it was the board of regents for the UC schools, and they uh, they were going to raise the tuition. So there were thousands of students that came down from Berkeley, from UC Santa Barbara, came up from UC San Diego, it was at UCLA. They let 40 students into the meeting. Yeah. My roommates and I got in, they gave us the agenda and the agenda had on it about a third of the way down discussion of the tuition increases at UC schools. And right beneath it, it said time for student comment and student response. Yeah. As soon as the regents walked into the room, the students started screaming obscenities, throwing chairs across the room. Ooh. It was crazy. Wow. And the, and the moderator got up and said, we want you students in here. You could see you've been given the agenda. We want to hear what you have to say, but we've got other things to discuss. You disrupt this meeting again, you're out of here. Yeah. They, they did it again. They just started throwing chairs, screaming obscenities. They told them to go out. So the students went outside and said that the regents wouldn't allow free speech. Mm. They didn't say to the students, we were so obnoxious, we screwed up your opportunity to have a voice in that meeting. Yeah. Put the onus on somebody else rather than owning the responsibility of their screw up. Yeah. Well, Jerry, is that the time where you walked out through a different door and you got interviewed? Well, the students were went out, the regents were at the front of the room and they went out a side door. And rather than going out with the other students, I went through another side door and came in the room. There was Ronald Reagan right there. Wow. I had met him about 34 or 35 times before. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him real fast, cause I knew I didn't have much time. Governor Reagan, I don't know if you remember me or not, my name's Jerry Root. I worked in a campaign in 1968 in Miami, Florida. And since that time I've become a Christian, I'm here with a bunch of campus for Christ people. And we're here sharing uh, the gospel with people. And I'm wondering if you've ever heard of the free speech blog. And he looked at me and said, you know, Jerry, I didn't remember your name, but I remember your face. And he put his arm around me. And he said, um, I was discouraged when I came back from Miami. He ran as a favorite son candidate mm -hmm. for uh, president 
the year that Nixon won the nomination. Okay. So he, he said, uh, I was discouraged, and my pastor, Don Moomau, led me to Christ at that time. And he told me he was going up to Arrowhead Springs for a weekend of Bible studies with Bill Bright the next month. Wow. And he put me in a room to witness to three of his aides. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, when I was done talking with those guys, I came out, and the lights and camera are going. And this reporter saying, as soon as I walked out of the room, we do know there was one student who was able to talk to the governor. And the camera and lights people are pointing to me. He turns around, he goes, there he is. He goes running up to me. And the reporter says, what was it that you said to the governor? And I start talking about Jesus on the live <laughs> broadcast. I think the guy wanted to kink the hose, you know, but there was nothing he could do about it. Oh, it's so it good. Fun. So it, wasn't, it wasn't just sharing Jesus with uh Reagan, it was sharing Jesus with a live newscast at a riot at UCLA. Yeah. We were the protests and riots all the time. It was a lot of fun. It was different then, though, than here now. Yeah. Yeah. Because back then, you may disagree with people, but you listen to each other. Okay. You had discussion. Yeah. Today, if you disagree with somebody, you shut them off. Is it crazy or right. hateful or you call them a name, you dismiss them with something? And, and it's, it's incredible to me how today, we are dumbing down because of our inability to listen to each other and have that true dialogue. Yeah, I believe that. And for those of you uh, watching on YouTube, you can see the, the images. You can see that Jerry is glowing with the Shekinah glory because of... <laughs> it's the reflection of the sun. It's what happens when you're bald and you have white hair and white beard. <laughs> I like it. It's a good look. Well, Jerry, I wanted to get into your work with C.S. Lewis. Uh, and I wanted to start with... Uh, talking about your PhD, you did your PhD in England with Dr. Basil Mitchell, who is one of the progenitors of analytic theology and uh, the cumulative case apologetics, uh, which relies on inference to the best explanation. Basil Mitchell is a, is a huge name in apologetics. How, how did you get introduced with him? Um, the people in the, I, I did my doctorate in the Open University through the Oxford Center for Mission Studies, and they had contacted him. And he was a prof the Nolik Professor of Philosophy of the Christian Religion. He had just retired, but he was still taking on a few students, and I was his last student ever. Matter wow. of fact, he, he um, I think I drove him from education. <laughs> but he was he was my first supervisor. Lyle Dorset was my second supervisor. Okay. The last draft of my thesis, I also included two rhetoricians, Jeff Davis from Wheaton College and Steve Beebe from uh, Texas State University. Oh, I didn't know Beebe was on yours as well. Yeah, he was incredible. Both both he and Jeff were incredible. I had unbelievable supervisors. Yeah. But Mitchell, Mitchell was, uh, he was with C.S. Lewis at Oxford. He, he's younger than Lewis, mm -hmm. but he, he was the vice president of the Oxford Socratic Club. And then when Lewis went on to Cambridge University, Mitchell became the uh, president of Oxford Lewis Society, or the oh. Oxford Socratic Society, Socratic Club. And so it, it, was a, it was a great experience. He was a wonderful person and, wonderful, and helpful to me. Also, um, we became friends, Oz Guinness and I became friends as a result of that, because Oz Guinness was his MA supervisor and, and Phil supervisor. Oh, yeah. And was going to be his DPhil supervisor, but Guinness said for the kinds of things you want to do on cultural critique, you probably need Pete Berger who is a great sociologist and also a fine Christian. And so Guinness did his doctor with him. But it was because of their common association with, with Mitchell that Guinness and I first met each other and began that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Wow, that's huge. And now, of Guinness. course, Guinness has done so much to make Peter Berger famous for a lot of us uh, evangelicals, you know, now that the Peter Berger name is out there because a lot of, of, of his work. Well, his, his name was out there before because he's such an eminent sociologist, right. but you read stuff like The Rumor of Angels and mm -hmm. Reality is Socially Constructed and these sorts of books. They're fabulous books. I love Berger. Yeah. So, so Jerry, you've, you've written books on Lewis, including uh, your, your book on Dimer. Is, is that out yet? It's coming out at the end of October okay. with InterVarsity Press. And Dimer was uh, CS, one of C.S. Lewis's books before he was a believer. Is that right? Yeah, he, Lewis published two books before he became a Christian. One was called Spirits and Bondage, and it was a cycle of lyric poetry. Okay. It came out in 1919. He was working on it before World War I, during World War I. It comes out immediately after World War I. And for a time, Lewis was considered one of the World War I war poets, you know, with Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. I didn't know that. He didn't catch fire like those other guys did. And yeah. then Dimer he had been working on for many, many years. 
and it's kind of a myth, and it, it's a wonderful poem, I think, myself. It came out in 1926, okay. but in this particular poem, while Lewis isn't a Christian, you can see something of the questing heart coming through, even in the poetry, yeah. and I think it's significant to the corpus of Lewis, um, and I, a lot of people, they, they don't read it because it's pre-Christian. It's also a hundred-page narrative poem. <laughs> People don't generally read near the poems. Right. My dear friend, Jeff Davis, who's the Dean of Humanities at Wheaton College, he gave responses to the lectures I gave on Daimler at the Wade Center at Wheaton. And, and <laughs> Jeff Davis hates the poem. And, and his <laughs> response was one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. And I laughed my head off. Um, but he, he said, we owe a great debt to this poem because it was this poem that chased Lewis out of the poetry market, and drove him <laughs> into writing prose, and we have the great prose writer, C.S. Lewis. So Daimler was valuable only in that regard. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I disagree. I think it's, I think it's a good poem, but what yeah. do I know? <laughs> so that, that'll be coming out soon. You also have The Surprising Imagination of C.S. Yeah. Lewis. With Another Mark Neal. With Mark Neal, that's right. And uh, you guys go over, is it 12 different uses of... Uh, there's actually 31 different ways that Lewis uses the term imagination. You know how they say people who live in, in the north, you know, in the frozen areas or this tundra and stuff, they have 31, 30 different ways of saying snow. Right, sure. You know, sl uh, slushy snow, new snow, yeah, powder snow, yeah. whatever. Because they live there 24, uh, uh, 24 7. Well, Lewis lived in the life of the imagination. He even said, the imaginative man in me is older, more continuously operative than the rational man. Mm. And so Lewis, who, who valued the imagination so much, and by the way, you cannot increase your understanding of anything without some employ of the imagination. Right. Even scientists know this. Right. They begin to start with a hypothesis to test things, and the hypothesis is imaginative. Yeah, same they with models. And, sure. When they discover something, they use models, which is mm -hmm. an imaginative depiction. Yeah. So Lewis understood this, but also sometimes the imagination, like all things human and fallen, can be used badly as well. Mm. We can, uh, what Lewis calls a transforming imagination. It would be like what psychologists call projection. Yeah. We project on something what we want it to be, and then, like a straw man argument, is an informal fallacy. We then begin to dismantle this this bad representation that we projected on somebody yeah we'll see those those things too and for for your bach says that that's what we do with god we project our ideas of god up into the sky and uh and i think uh freud talked about that as well right well yeah but all all, all thought about god will be beneath him c.s mm -hmm. lewis said i want god not my idea of god right but that doesn't mean you can't have a sure word mm -hmm. you you can you can have a truth you can have confidence but even the truth you know you hold with a degree of humility because yeah. you've never plumbed the depths of it. Is that... You've never seen all the breadth of application. It may yeah. be perfectly applied to a question you haven't even asked. So you can have a, a, a sure word without having a last word. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can't get a last word because God's infinite and we're finite and fallen as we think about it. Um, but, but also sometimes you can't get to a truth, but you can still get to a high degree of probability. Mm -hmm. You would call that, of course, opinion. Opinion's based on probability rather than certainty. It's subject to doubt. Reasonable people could differ on yeah. matters of opinion. Okay. Yeah, so, so that one's a great work. I, I recommend everyone grab that one. There's also, you, you did the C.S. Lewis Study Bible. Is that right? Yeah, I did it with Doug Gresham, but I did uh, probably 95% of the quotes in okay. that book that are put in different passages i did and then and i wrote the introduction to it as well and then from that you have the the quotable c.s lewis i don't know if yeah. you guys can see that that one's thick enough you could press flowers in it or stop doors with it that's right and uh that's an encyclopedia so it, it's you look in you say what did c.s lewis say about hell and it's it's a lot of different quotes and we on. go through all of his books everything is referenced so if you needed to use a quote for a paper you could find the publication date you could find the page number and all that stuff yeah it saved me a lot of time in my papers and then you also uh here this one isn't cs lewis related but i wanted to uh plug it anyways naked and unashamed and this yeah. is this is a a guide for for marriage a guide for the necessary work of christian marriage and 
Jerry, is this specifically for premarital counseling or is this for married couples as well? It, it, it grows out of our premarital counseling, but, but the stuff that you're told about in premarital counseling is stuff that you should probably keep fresh throughout your marriage, right? That's yeah. why you're told it. Right, totally. And, and the idea of naked and unashamed, um, the art of marriage is learning how to undress. Hmm. To undress physically is fairly easy, so easy that animals can do it. <laughs> sometimes people move immediately to that kind of undressing. Yeah. They get involved sexually, and they never undress psychologically, historically, intellectually, spiritually. Yeah. And consequently, then, they end up marrying a body they know well, but not a person they know at all. Mm. We say there's great wisdom why God says, save the sexual union till after marriage, and work hard on becoming one. And so that book is about that. Uh, Jeremy Rios, who, who entered into the writing of it with us, he was a, a former student of mine, and, and I did his premarital counseling in his marriage. He went on and, and uh, became a pastor, and he got the material, and he was using it also in okay. his premarital counseling, and he helped us contemporize the book. Oh, He's great. now finishing up his, his PhD at St. Andrews University in Scotland. Oh, wow. Great school. And then uh, to keep to keep moving on here, this is my favorite one of yours, and I know maybe maybe that's sad for you. I don't know, but the uh, C.S. Lewis and the Problem of Evil. This is right up my alley. I love it. This is this is out of your this is your dissertation, right? That's that's the book that Basil Mitchell and Lyle Dorsett, Steve Beebe, and Jeff Davis guided me in. Awesome. So I was writing it, but it, it's a, I mean it. The people that order that book are usually anesthesiologists because they find that they're cheaper to prescribe than the drugs and hold people in a deeper sleep longer. But it's a uh, fairly academic book. Yeah, you can see it's Princeton theological monographs, but 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 it, it it's it's thorough. Yeah, I, mean, I want to come back to that uh, later in our conversation, but right now I wanted to focus on your your newest book with Mark Neal again. The I feel bad that you have all these books. This probably. You but you've given me a few of them, so don't. Well, that's good. That. <laughs> I feel bad. I should have given you a mole. I would hate to think that you went out and bought them. Well, I, I went out and bought them uh, before our first meeting, so I could know a little bit about you. Um, but so, so this Mark Neal, you wrote the neglected C.S. Lewis, um, and you address this in your book in the first chapter. You know what? Does C.S. Lewis really seem like he's neglected? He's got all these books still going. He's a bestseller. His books have been translated in multiple languages. So what do you mean by the neglected C.S. Lewis? Well, first off, there's about 73 titles that bear Lewis's name. He wrote 56 books in his lifetime. Connection. Yeah. Are we okay? Are you with yeah. me? Yeah, I'm back now. Yep. Okay. So there, there are 73 titles that bear Lewis's name. He wrote about 56 books in his life. So the rest he wrote after he died. <laughs> now, what, what happened was Walter Hooper, brilliant guy, who mm -hmm. pulled together um, essays and different periodicals that would have been lost to the average reader. Yep. He pulled them together and put them under common cover. But there's now about 73 titles. Plus, there's eight volumes of his letters that are out there. Yep. Three major volumes in Hooper's collected letters. But there are others, you know, uh, his letters to children. His letters, letters to lady, lady right. his Latin letters, and so on. Well, anyway, the best books Lewis wrote, hands down, better than his Christian apologetics, his children's stories, his science fiction, his screw tape letters, and all that stuff, are his academic books that he wrote at Oxford University and Cambridge University. Mm. But most people don't read them. They're intimidated by them. So they might say, well, I've never read Paradise Lost, so why should I read a preface to Paradise Lost? Yeah. They don't realize that that's a threshold going into the book. It could give you a great introduction to the book. And if you haven't read Paradise Lost, you, you need to go read that. There's a reason why it's considered one of the great classes. Yeah. And, and so consequently, Lewis has these academic books. Um, his, his Allegory of Love was the book that established his, his reputation as a medievalist. And it is a wonderful book. And it's one of the ones we cover in the neglected C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. He looks at the, 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 the allegory, the romantic allegory, the love allegory in, in medieval literature. And usually the love allegory in the early medieval literature was connected to uh, uh, adultery. Yeah, mistress because, right? mistress. because people in that day, particularly the leisured class that could write and read books, 
they they didn't always marry the person that they loved. Their marriages were arranged. Mm -hmm. So you had this adultery thing in there. And and the, the idea too about romantic literature, that, that grows out of um, uh, the concept of Rome as Virgil wrote about it in the Aeneid. Mm. Aeneas is from the city of Troy. Troy is destroyed in the in, in the Trojan Wars by the Greeks. He flees the city, and he's it's prophesied over him by Hector's ghost and by his wife's ghost that he will go establish a new city, Rome. So the idea of romantic comes out of the idea of longing for a place, longing for Rome. And wow. now, if I have a place longing, even a heaven longing could be considered romantic. But then it also got attached to other kinds of longings, the longing for a person. So now we think of romantic literature as, as written about a person. It could be also the longing to have what's broken and us fixed, kind of like what Wordsworth writes about in the prelude. Once uh -huh. again, then, Lewis is writing in this allegory of love about this romantic literature that begins in a sort of fallen expression of longing for somebody that's inappropriate, but he sees the development throughout medieval literature till finally you come to the zenith in the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, where the idealized love beyond your love for God uh -huh. or, or, or beneath, just beneath your love for God in the Ordo Amorous, as Augustine writes about it, ordered love and so uh -huh. would be your love for your spouse. And so in the Fairy Queen, it's elevated. And Lewis is basically saying Edmund Spencer got it. He understood yeah. this stuff. We, we in, in our culture, we don't get it. Yeah, that's amazing to see. And, and I love that too, how you can trace that theme out and even to see the redemption of, of that understanding of romantic love. It's amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. So that would be one of the books that we covered in the neglected C.S. Lewis. Of course, there were others as well. Yeah, I uh, want to Lewis, talk about the, the personal heresy, if we could. Ah, uh, the personal heresy. So there was a guy named Ian W. Tilliard. He was the master of Jesus College, Cambridge, and he had written a book on Milton and said that he thought that Milton was about nothing else than the state of Milton's mind when he wrote. Mm -hmm. and, and Lewis took issue with it in a, in a literary annual that came out of uh, Oxford University called Essays and Studies, and, and he he called it the personal heresy. Yeah. You're concerned about the person, and you're missing the literature. Then it's 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 about anything but the state of his mind. It's about what he saw or what he was imaginatively seeking to depict. Mm -hmm. He said, when when you read a book, you use the author as spectacle, seeing through his eyes. The one thing you can't see when you see through somebody else's eyes is the person. Mm. So you use him as spectacles. You don't make a spectacle of the author. Yeah. And so Lewis and, and Cotillo had this debate. So Lewis wrote this response in Essays and Studies. The next year, Tilliard wrote a response. The next year, Lewis wrote another response. They said, hey, this is pretty good stuff. <laughs> we should do a book on it. And so they did the book together with several chapters. And, 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 and it's, a, it's a debate that breeds light, not heat. Yeah. It's a debate in this age where we have all kinds of salacious argumentation with no progress whatsoever. Because no Nobody listens to each other. This is a model debate. You can't find an informal fallacy in the book. You can't find an ad hominem. There's no oh. calling people names. Lewis doesn't call uh, Tilliard a racist. Tilliard doesn't call Lewis a Marxist. You know, you, yeah. you, you just you have real development in the debate. And it's a model for us, we who have lost our moorings on how yeah. to do this sort of thing. Yeah. So I think it's an important book. I, I thought that was that was so helpful to read. Um, do, you, do you know, did they get along uh, did they become friends that in exchange or not, or not well, really they, they were at different institutions so the proximity for them to become friends was probably not possible sure i don't think either of, i know lewis i think lewis won the debate myself sure but there are places where tilliard wrote later and he speaks highly of lewis hmm. and, and and tilliard was older than lewis he, he had probably a greater reputation at the time the book went on Okay. But I think, too, because Lewis held his own and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with this following academic, yeah. Lewis's own status was elevated by virtue oh. of that. Oh, he great. wasn't trying to use the debate to increase his status. He was just trying to engage in good academic debate. But Tilliard writes in other books. T Tilliard probably is most known for his book, The uh, Elizabethan World Picture, I think it's called. 
So on the, it is it is to the Elizabethan era what C.S. Lewis's di discarded image is to the medieval era. Okay. But, but, but um, he writes about Lewis in positive ways, and I think that they had respect for each other. Okay. And uh, Jerry, is the is Lewis's initial um, contention against Tilliard is is it the, uh, the is the personal heresy what he's writing about in the abolition of man? Is it the same subjective turn that he's seeing, or is it something different? Well, well, the difficulty when, when we think about subject, we're, we're all subjective. We should uh -huh. be. We're subjects, we right? The yeah. I perspective on things, mm -hmm. but we become subjectivistic or subjectivism sets in when we no longer consider the object. So the yeah. goal is to recognize that we're people who live in a world of objects, whether they be material objects or objects of thought set apart by definition from which we can think about inferentially and so on. Yeah. So, so consequently, uh, subjectivism is when I'm no longer paying attention to the object. So what happened with, with Tilliard is that Tilliard says it's not about Milton's book, it's about the state of Milton's mind. Yeah. Well, now all of a sudden, Tilliard isn't dealing with text. He, he can project on the text. Yeah. Uh, 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 Milton's not there. He, if I'm a psychologist, he can't get on my couch. <laughs> so consequently, even, even the projection, it's about the state of Milton's mind becomes a total fantasy. Yeah. It's a projection. Yeah. And so that, there's the transforming imagination again. Okay. I think that there's some subjectivism at play. I'm not convinced that Tilliard was a subjectivist per sure. se, but this would be a, this wasn't his finest hour. Yeah. That okay. say on Milton wasn't his finest hour. Okay. So, so Lewis is pointing that out and, and throughout, it, it, you looked at the book, the uh, uh, C.S. Lewis and A Problem of Evil, an huh. investigation of a pervasive theme. There's an entire chapter in there. It took me a year to write it. Yeah. On Lewis's understanding of literary criticism. And he is constantly taking to task multiple expressions of subjectivism and literary criticism that takes you away from the text and takes you into the critic yeah. rather than allowing the critic to open us up so that we could see the text better. Yeah, I want to cover that more. I'm so tempted to jump in, but I want to do a little bit more justice to the neglected C.S. Lewis before we jump in. I wanted to talk, since you brought it up, the uh, the discarded image. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's one of my favorites. And I don't think I knew about that book before I met you, but I, I'm pretty sure you encouraged me to jump into it. And I've used it in some of my papers. Can you just give us a, an overview? What What is the discarded image? Well, well, first off, Lewis is trying to write a book on the medieval worldview, mm -hmm. so that when a person reads a medieval book, they're not projecting 21st century values into it. They're understanding the matrix of which that book grew. Yeah. And, and he says that basically every era is going to produce a discarded image. We will, we will respond to those who came before us. There are some things that will be perennially involved in our understanding of human thought. That's okay, because even if I reject some things, I'm still incorporating other things. Mm -hmm. He says that the development reflects continuity and change. I may need to change, but if there's no continuity, then there's no development. Yeah. So that becomes important. And, and in the discarded image, as he looks at the medieval worldview, he, he, he gives, it's, it's just brilliant background. It's wonderful stuff. And it helps us think analytically then about our own age. Lewis yeah. rightly says, every age has its excesses. It's things that are wrong. Yeah. And we can go back and look in the past and see where others goofed up. But we can't go forward and then from that forward perspective, look where we're goofing up. <laughs> Right. What we can do is gain some sort of comparative understanding. If we understand the past, the past went off the rails at places, yeah. but not all the places where we may have gone off the rails. And so we can gain some comparison and make some comparative judgments and begin to make some, some degree of analysis of where we're at, where the excesses have been faulty and where the good has been beneficial. Yeah. And so Lewis, his biggest idea in all of his books, all of his books, our reality is iconoclastic. Mm -hmm. In I other words, yeah. I have an image of God, say, or even of my world, or even of myself. That image, it may be formed by having late night discussions with friends, hearing a lecture, maybe a sermon, reading a book, 
Well, several pieces of the puzzle may come together and it gives me greater clarity. If I hold on to that present image too tightly, it will compete against my having a growing understanding of these things. Yeah. So consequently, reality, which is far more complex than my best grasp of it, reality destroys the image. Reality breaks the idol. Yeah. C.S. Lewis said, God's always kicking out the walls of temples we build for him because he wants to give us more. Yeah. So this discarded image is a great example of what Lewis's big idea is in virtually all of his books. Reality is iconoclast. There's a phrase that you've used before, and I'm not sure if it's from Lewis or if it's a, a Jerry Root original, about scoliosis and adjusting the scoliosis. Can you say yeah. that? I forget how it goes, though. Well, you could tell I was a former PE major, right? So we would talk <laughs> about all these body things, and scoliosis is curvature of the spine. Mm -hmm. Well, as fallen individuals, I think we have scoliosis of the soul, scoliosis mm -hmm. of the reason, scoliosis of the emotion, scoliosis of the will. And we need to adjust the scoliosis of our soul by the plumb line of reality. Yeah. And I, I, I think, again, we mentioned Peter Berger. Peter Berger's right when he says reality is socially constructed. He doesn't mean by that that he's a relativist. Sure. He doesn't think it's up for grabs. He just thinks it's so complex that the more eyes we have on it, the better we can increase our bandwidth of understanding. Yeah. And I, I think he's right. And, and, and C.S. Lewis said, too, at the end of Experiment Criticism, my own eyes are not enough for me. Mm. I would see what others have seen. I would read what they've written. Yeah. Even that's not enough for me. I would read what they've imagined. Even that's not enough for me. I regret that the brutes cannot write books. Mm. Gladly would I see how the world comes attract, uh, to the eye of a mouse or a bee or how it comes to the olfactory sense of a dog. There's something or, else or about bear. this. Right? Huh? Writes, or a bear. There you go. I don't want to be around the bear, though. I don't want to, I don't want to engage in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he writes from the, from the perspective but, but, of a bear in uh, That Hideous Strength, Mr. Bolton. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. true. But, yeah. there, but there's another piece to this, too, Parker, I think. And, and that's that in the Bible, in the New Testament, 60% of the you's in the New Testament are plural. Mm. The Bible was to be understood in community. Yeah. And we, we can see goofiness. You know, how, how often have you ever heard a pastor, you know, hold up his Bible after he preaches a sermon and he says, I'm not telling you this. This is the word of God. Well, then he just extended the doctrine of inerrancy to his interpretation. Yeah. Well, once he does that, I believe the Bible is divinely inspired. I believe it's inerrant in the original autographs, but I don't believe my interpretation of it's inerrant. Sure. So consequently, I end up making my word equal to God. C.S. Lewis said the worst of bad men a religious bad man. Quicker I might be willing to die for my faith, maybe I'd be willing to kill for my faith, or pain of thus saith the Lord across my own opinions. Hmm. But once I start doing that, then you're not disagreeing with me, you're disagreeing with right. God. Right. That's an unhealthy position for any pastor to take. Yeah. It needs to be some degree of hermeneutical suspicion, even of our own interpretation. That doesn't mean we can't have a sure word, Yeah. but but we need to be cautious about it. And, we, and that, that sounds like humility, right? It sounds like... Yeah. Being, being humble. Humility yeah. is a key. So there's, a, there's a, another story of yours that pops up when we talk about uh, correcting our, ourselves by external reality. And uh, I think of the, the woman and the urinal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to tell it? Yeah, can you recount that really quick for us? Yeah, I was in the, the bathroom on the third floor of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. I was in the stall making a full deposit. And, and there was this noise I heard somebody came into the bathroom I didn't think twice about it I finished up my duty and I came out of the stall and there's a woman standing at the mirror fixing her makeup she sees me coming out of the stall and she starts to berate me for being in the women's bathroom mm -hmm. so now clearly we have a difference in conceptual framework yep so I, I won the debate with one word. I just pointed and said urinals. <laughs> she screamed and ran out of the room. I've never seen her since. So <laughs> oh. but, but, but the deal is, what corrected the error? Mm -hmm. we, had, we had perception, but what corrected the error was the appeal to reality. Yeah. You can't always get to a full understanding, but we can grasp at some limited way something of significance. Yeah. So, uh, Jerry, are you familiar with Thomas Kuhn and the, the structure of, of scientific revolution? Yeah, yeah, I read that. I like that book. 
Yeah, so it seems like that's a little bit what Lewis is getting at with the discarded image, but it seems people have criticized Kuhn for being uh, a relativist because he says, you know, it's just you jump from one model to the next, whereas Lewis seems like he's saying, no, you're, you're still holding on to something that was true the whole time, but in correcting your theories of reality, you're still progressing towards more truth. Does that sound right? Well, well I don't think, I don't think my read was that Thomas Kuhn wasn't a relativist. Okay. He is saying these, these understandings, the scientific understanding should be corrected based on new data coming in. Uh -huh. And if we're doing good investigation, there will always be new data. It's the same sort of thing with this COVID-19 coronavirus thing. You've got all these people saying how this thing should be approached yeah. and how we should respond to it. But I, if you've watched any of the, the presentations that were done daily for a while, mm -hmm. um, they, they were constantly adjusting their assessments because they were discovering new things. Yeah. You have people getting impatient with people who are making new judgments. Well, you said two weeks ago. Yeah, but I didn't know two weeks ago this. Right. So it's, it's not a relativism. It's just a willingness to, to look and discover and then adjust what we think by virtue of the discovery. Some yeah. things we jettison. Change, change will always be necessary if we're developing. We have to decide what kind of change is called upon at a given moment. Is it a change of kind? We totally scrap the, 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 the conceptual framework we're working with. Yeah. Or do we add new information and make the present conceptual framework more robust? So we call these uh, uh, a change of uh, kind, scrap the old, yeah. or a change of degree, like a tree, when it adds new rings to its girth uh, in its trunk, it's still the tree, the same tree, but it's, it's obviously more mature example. Yeah. I really like that. It reminds me of a uh, of philosopher and epistemologist Roderick Tr Chisholm says in, in epistemology, there's two ways you can go. You can go with the particularist or you can go with the methodism. Uh, and the methodism says, I have this frame and I'm going to fit everything into this method where the particularist says, I have this, these data points. I need to adjust my theory to, to make sense of the data. Um, and I, th I think that's what Lewis is. Yeah, you know, we need to correct ourselves based on reality and based on interpersonal dialogue, seeing from other people's eyes, just like you've been saying. Well, there was a great C.S. Lewis scholar who died a few years back. He was a good friend. His name was Bruce Edwards. Mm. And he had been the Dean of Humanities at Bowling Green State University. And he once said to me, I think rightly, that he say these things, that the entire academic world depends upon seeing patterns and exceptions. Hmm. So the patterns are drawn from the particulars, like you said, and we can abstract from them some general understanding. Uh -huh. But the general understanding is not the thing itself. Right. So consequently, the general understanding without the, without the exception is falsified. Mm -hmm. But if I'm always accounting for exceptions, I can't pass on a body of knowledge. Right. So this becomes important. And C.S. Lewis said, too, about this sort of thing, there is... In the history of thought, there is no, there is nothing like a shoreline in geography. And yes. I, in the sea. And this minute yes. I was hoping you'd this bring this up. I, this minute I'm on the, in the Middle Ages, this minute I'm in the Enlightenment or something like mm -hmm. that. So these, these lines that are drawn are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. uh, periods are not facts, C.S. Lewis said. Everybody's running around in the Middle Ages saying, yeah. hey, I live in the Middle Ages. You right, know? right. That's our projection on those times, but the projections are fair-minded. We could say in this time, there was a general understanding and we can abstract from the data this. Mm -hmm. The abstraction is a helpful tool, but it is not a universally to be applied tool. Yeah. Because there are exceptions. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, to move on to the, uh, the Ohel book because I, I think that uh, his work on, on making that was uh, so impressive that I think people need to hear what he did to, to write that book. Well, you say, oh, hell, because it was published as the Oxford History of English Literature. Yep. Because it took Lewis 18 years from the time he started that book till it came out. He called it his oh, hell book. It was an <laughs> albatross around his neck that gave him affinity to Coleridge when he wrote The Ancient Mariner. Hmm. So anyway, the, the thing about this book, though, is to write the book on English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama, which is mm -hmm. the title of he read every book written in English in the 16th century. He read every book translated into English in the original language it was written, Old French, Italian, 
Latin, whatever it might be, and in translation so that he can make a judgment about the translation if it was good or bad and be fair-minded about it. So that means he knew those languages well enough to read them in incredible. In, in yeah, well, in, 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 in the Latin letters of C.S. Lewis, yeah. this priest in Italy wanted to write Lewis because he had read some of his books in Italian that had been mm -hmm. translated in Italian. He wanted to write him in Italian, but didn't think Lewis knew Italian, but Lewis did. So he wrote him in Latin. So Lewis wrote him back in Latin and they carried on because the, the, the priest thought that Lewis as an academic in Oxford would know Latin. Yeah. They carried on a correspondence 16 years. Yeah. Which Latin. is so amazing. But, but in that book, the English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama, you think about it. Well, one, it's written with Lewis's clarity. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's also written with Lewis's wit and humor. There are places where you're reading this book and you just burst out laughing while you're reading because it's so yeah. funny. The other thing too, is he opens more than wardrobe doors. Mm -hmm. There are places in that book where he causes you to look at a poet. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I didn't know about Michael Drayton. I'd never heard of him until I yeah. first read. I've read English literature in 16th century a bunch of times. But the first time I read it, I go, what he says about Michael Drayton is fascinating to me. So I went and read Drayton's work called Idea, which is full of sonnets and his poetry. And it was breathtaking to me. I yeah. was glad I got to Drayton. I wouldn't have gotten to him through. It, it, he even writes about Barnaby Gooch. He's the guy that wrote the poem, Out of Sight, Out of Mind. When I was okay. in college, everybody was saying Out of Sight. It was a big idiom. But here's oh, yeah. Barnaby Gooch, the first guy writing about it and stuff. But, and he actually uses the term puddle glum in that book, too, which okay. we later find in, in uh, The Silver Chair, the character puddle glum, the march with but in, in that book, if you'll remember, the 16th century is the century of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And he has a whole section on, on the, the, the works of religious controversy. Yeah. Lewis is the only person I know who read thoroughly both sides of the Reformation. And because he read thoroughly, his judgments are more nuanced. Yeah. He said the Catholics thought that the Reformers were all antinomian. Mm -hmm. the, Reformers thought the Catholics were all Pelagian. Yeah. Well, you could find Pelagians among the Catholics, and you could find antinomians among the Protestants. But Lewis's judgment is basically, in order to find those people, you had to look at the worst example of the other side. Yeah. Thomas Aquinas said, uh, an abuse does not nullify a proper use. Yeah. If you judge any segment of society by its worst examples, nobody could stand. Right. So Lewis said both the Catholics and the Protestants were wrong. Hmm. Because they, they weren't reading each other. They weren't concentrating. Now we got people who are still fighting the Reformation, but they only read the worst examples of the other side. Yeah. Now, Lewis had his opinion. He falls decidedly on the side of, the, uh, uh, of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, you've got all kinds of people now after the fact who are trying to, in revisionist history, make yeah. Lewis seem like he was Catholic. Yeah, we're all fighting over the bones. Lewis was certainly sensitive towards Catholics. He, he mm -hmm. didn't dismiss them because of that background. His, in the Inklings, half the Inklings were Catholics, half of them were Protestants. They were fine Christians. The one thing that was interesting, though, is Lewis, before, six months before he died, he's writing a letter explaining to a former student why he is Protestant and not Catholic. Wow. So it t sort of takes some of the wind out of the sails of the others. But so what? So, he, so right. he's a Protestant. That doesn't right. mean he can't have good relationships with Catholics. He may have his disagreements and he sure. may have his good reasons for those disagreements, but he doesn't have to be utterly dismissive. If they've yeah. got the atonement right, if they understood that Jesus died on the cross to reconcile them, forgive them of their sins and bring them into proper relationship with God, give them the hope of heaven. Well, my word, let's be brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Jerry, there, um, I can't remember the exact step. Do you remember how many genres Lewis wrote in? Well, it depends on how you count them. Uh -huh. It's anywhere from 11 to 17, depending on how you count them. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So broad. Well, so I wanted to, to move on. Uh, anyone listening, go out and buy Jerry's book. There's a ton that you can learn from the neglected C.S. Lewis. And like Jerry said, he, uh, Lewis opens more than wardrobe doors. He will put you on to a whole bunch of authors that you should have already been reading. We should have read as children um, or growing up in our education. But uh, it's never too late. So I suggest you go buy that book right now. What, you know, one other thing about that too, Parker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in school, even in high school, students will read um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Yep. 
but usually they read the wife of bass tale or the miller's tale and these are so salacious mm -hmm. so the teachers have us read them because of all their sexual humor and all that stuff we don't read the ones that are deeply spiritual because they in public school steer us away from them sure but you read the allegory of love and lewis talks about the chaucer work troilus and cressida mm. And this work, it, it's one of the best books I've ever read. And I got to it through Lewis. And I remember finishing it on a plane and I am absolutely weeping after I finished this book. Wow. The plane wasn't crowded, I'm scrunching down, not because I'm embarrassed of the tears, but I knew I couldn't do justice to this world I'd been living in for the last couple of weeks. And somebody asked me why I was crying. Yeah. The book begins wow. with Chaucer as a storyteller asking for prayer. He asks for prayer for himself as a storyteller that'll tell the story well. He asks for prayer for people who have never been in love that they might know love. Yeah. For people who have experienced unrequited love that they might find respite and that the person might love them in return. Mm. He prays for those who have been in love and have fallen out of love that their hearts might mend. And he prays for those again who have never been in love that they might find love. Yeah. And then as he tells the story, this glorious story, of the love of Troilus and Cressida and the misunderstandings that come in and the sadnesses that occur. The whole story ends with Chaucer saying, another prayer, blessed Jesus, turn all our loves to thee. Mm. And it's right along with Lewis's thing about the first and second things. You put first things yeah. first, you get second things then put second things first, you lose out first and second things. Again, Augustine's Ordo Amorous, the yep. ordered loves by which maturity would learn to navigate life. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I, I, need, to, I need to read that. I, I definitely haven't. Uh, I'll tell you, if you're going to read it, see if you can find a broken up set of the uh, great books of the Western world by the Chaucer edition, because it has in one column modern English, and in the other column it has a Chaucerian English. Is that, so, you're talking about Adler's? Are you talking about Adler's? Yeah, the works? Adler's yeah. Great Books of the Western World. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you go to a Shakespeare play, it takes you a few minutes to get acclimated to the Shakespearean English, Elizabethan uh -huh. English, but you can do it. Well, now go that much further back, or almost that much further back, and you get to Chaucer's English, it's kind of tough. Okay. Eventually, you could start to get up to speed with it if you follow the two columns. Okay. Yeah, I inherited the, uh, the great works. They're right here on my shelf from my grandmother. And uh, then through talking with you a little bit more, I got really into Adler and I looked on my shelf and I already had his uh, Syntopicon volume one and two. It's yeah. amazing. I reference it for all of every paper I write now. It's great. So, yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Well, you. You intrigue me, Parker, because of your, your questing mind, your sense of awe and wonder, your pursuit of truth. Oh no. You, you are like, you are like the, the teacher's ideal student that every every teacher says at least every teacher should say i hope all my students become like this student and then hopefully the teacher will say and i hope i can approximate some of that wonder and awe as well i appreciate that jerry that's that's huge i'm supposed to be flattering you here though so so <laughs> i don't need to be flattered <laughs> well so i wanted to move on so we got the neglected cs list we talked a little bit about some of his most neglected works i wanted to talk about his three favorites and i think i've got this right i, I heard it somewhere maybe it was from you but I think his three favorites that he wrote were Till We, Till we Have Faces, Perilandra, and The Abolition of Man. Is that correct? Yeah, he wrote that in a letter and said to somebody, these are my three favorite, these are my three favorite books Okay. of, of, the, of the ones he had written. Right. So I wanted to start with, uh, with Till We Have Faces. Why, why do you think Lewis would include Till We Have Faces in one of his three favorites? Well, I think, I think it, 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 it's his one great novel i mean he's got some of this satire you know in in uh, in the great divorce which is a wonderful book i think short one easy to read you can read it in an evening and you've got some satire in in uh, that collection of letters it's a letter form but screw tape letters yep and you've got the science fiction novels and you've got the children's books but the one serious attempt at a novel is to we have faith. Yeah. And Lewis takes an old story and embellishes it. And he writes even in the discarded image and several other places as well. The gen genius of a medieval book, he writes about it in uh, studies in medieval and Renaissance literature. 
he says a, a medieval book they would take an old story yeah and embellish it and embellish it in a way that would help them make it the vehicle to say something significant and unique or new that they wanted to say well we we still see it in our day you, you take movies like west side story it's romeo and juliet yeah retold. right you take august rush it's oliver twist retold you take bridget jones diary it's Christ and Prejudice retold. You take Inception. It's basically the story of Orpheus and Eurydice retold. Oh, and I never thought of that. Got, uh, oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? It's yeah, uh, the Odyssey. Um, the Odyssey retold. Mm -hmm. Lewis did this too in, 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 um, in Prince Caspian. It's Hamlet retold. Right. As is the Lion King, basically, Hamlet retold. And then he, he does this several places, but until we have faces, he's basically embellishing the myth of Cupid and Psyche. Yeah. And, and the character who's the main character is this woman named Orul, or Oruel, some say. And, and she is the queen of Glom, but in her early days, her, her father was a vicious guy, the king. Mm -hmm. and, and she decries her father, but in some ways doesn't realize she's a lot like him. Mm -hmm. He kind of controls people, and she doesn't realize she is also somewhat controlling. Lewis often would write a book in propositional form and then write about it in imaginative form in another book. So yeah. the propositional book for Till We Have Faces is The Four Loves. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And we see a lot of Orul's love uh, perverted because it becomes self-oriented. Yeah. It becomes need love rather than gift love. Mm -hmm. And so she... She kind of controls Psyche, her, her sister, step, uh, her half-sister born to her. She has a controlling interest in, in the fox, who's a Greekling, Greekling who teaches her a slave who's captured. Ardia, who's the head of her, her military after her father dies and she becomes queen. And, and she feels like she has a relationship with these people, and I think she does. But she sees also that she'd never liberated them. Matter of fact, there's a place where she tries to control Psyche to do what she wants her to right. do. Yeah. And, and Psyche ends up saying, I think there are forms of hate I love better than your form of hate. <laughs> and, and, and Orul is caught in the balances. She's a person between subjectivism and self-referentialism in a world where God is constantly trying to break in. Mm -hmm. Reality is iconoclastic. Right. And she's resisting the break-in. But finally, at the end of the book, of course, she gives up her guard and she surrenders. And I think the book ends well. Yeah. You know, and, and I could say the ending, I could quote it for you, but probably <laughs> no, you mess could. it up for your listeners. <laughs> yeah. There's there's a part because I love philosophy so much, uh, I was reading uh, I was reading the meditations. Um, Marcus Aurelius at the time that I was also reading Till We Have Faces. And they're quoting from the fox, who's this, this captured Greek slave who is also a philosopher. And he's basically their enslaved tutor. And uh, I, Psyche, I think, is quoting to a rule some of the teachings from Fox. And it's right out of uh, Marcus Aurelius. It's, you know, we wake, we'll wake up this morning and we'll deal with people who are... And it was just so cool that, that Lewis would bring in those kind of things from his own learning. Uh, well... Every time Lewis puts his pen to paper, his pen is the tight end of a funnel. Mm. And at the wide end, is all of his great reading that comes down to us yeah. through that pen. That's a great way to think of it. So I want to move on to uh, Paralandra. And that's the second in his space trilogy, as it's called, or the Ransom trilogy, because it follows this guy, Ransom. Um, who, real quick, uh, Jerry, is, is Ransom, is that Tolkien? Well, Ransom is the main character who runs through the space trilogy, mm -hmm. Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and that hideous string. Yeah. Out of the Silent Planet takes place on Mars. Paralandra takes place on Venus. That hideous string takes place on Earth. Yeah. And Ransom is, is uh, Lewis said he modeled him after Tolkien. Tolkien himself said, I see a lot of my ideas Lewisified through him. Oh, okay. I didn't know that it was a uh, it was yeah. out there. But, and was... what's his first, what's Ransom's first name? The philologist. Elwin. Elwin. And Elwin friend means of, friend, friend of the of elves. elves. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. So, so anyway, yeah. But Lewis felt that as far as um, technical excellence of writing, Perlandra was one of his three favorites. But in fact, he told Walter Hooper 
that of the science fiction books, he actually liked that hideous strength more. Okay. And I, I, my own experience was that way. I liked all of them. Yeah. But that hideous strength, I, I, I thought it was more intriguing. It, it, it was written. Lewis talks about um, uh, a lot of the writings of the Middle Ages, or late Middle Ages particularly. They're written with the form of the Italian epic at play. Yep. And the Italian epic you have an event going on. It finally is resolved, but immediately as it's resolved, we've got another tension and another event takes place and that mm -hmm. gives way to another. It's like watching a, 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 a uh, um, you know, the, the Indiana Jones movie, you know, sure. where one tension breaks into another. It's very entertaining. Yeah. And, and, and I think Lewis does that in that hideous strength. And we're, 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 we're on, you know, this story is going on here and then we break, we leave it off and we pick it up over here, another story, it breaks and we pick it up here and then finally we go back to the original one and so on. Yeah. It's a breathtaking approach to these things. I enjoy it as far as entertainment. Uh, Lewis wasn't the biggest fan, however, of swashbuckling type writing. He, he, okay. He was he was okay with uh, Alexander Dumont, you know, Three Musketeers, Count of Monte Cristo, but they weren't his favorites. But he does like the Italian epics. Okay. So consequently, I, d I don't know what to make of it. We get him on one place saying he really likes us, another place he's got kind of guarded. He's like all of us, I guess. We sure. Said in one context. <laughs> That's right. Well, that hideous strength was my favorite as well because it was he. I think it's he wrote it in 1948. Or forty seven, right, right, right around then, yeah. And it was it's a dystopian novel where it you see yeah. to Tolkien's U catastrophe at the, at the end. Sorry to to spoil it for anybody. Uh, so you see this this U catastrophe, which is good, and uh, but it's 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 a dystopian novel right uh, a year before Orwell wrote nineteen eighty four, which he wrote yeah. in nineteen forty eight for yeah. and published in forty nine. And so some people have said it's it's one of the great dystopian novels of the. 20th century that's been forgotten that that hasn't caught steam like it should have yeah and uh, well you talked about the the propositional form and the narratival form is the is that hideous strength the narratival form of the abolition of man or, or yeah yeah the, the abolition of man is the is the proposition that, you know where he's looking at uh, subjectivism and 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 seeing where it goes awry because it's no longer responsive to the objective reality. And again, okay. object material, empirically perceived, or object of thought, rationally perceived, set forth by definition, reason from inferentially sound in a sound way. Yeah. But but um, yeah, that hideous strength would be you you let go you let go of objective reality as a corrective to my misunderstanding. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's whatever I want to project. Right. And, and that makes me an anarchist in some way. Anarchists make bad community people. But if I can get enough anarchists to get on the same page, I get my little inner ring. Lewis writes about the, the hor horrible nature of the inner ring. Yeah. If I get my inner ring going, then it becomes a kind of tyranny. Mm -hmm. And you get control of a group of people. We, we, we've got all the protests going on now. People are not reading history. If they would read history, they would see every time you see something Marxist-like emerging, uh -huh. those people that riot, even in the French Revolution, those people that riot and brought about the toppling of the, un of, of the, of the nation or whatever, the state, whatever the state might be, those people that rioted and protested in Russia, those people that rioted and protested in China. Um, they always, once power is, it, once the government topples and somebody emerges in power, almost the first people they get rid of are those people that rioted because yeah. they're the ones that could be thorns on their side too. Right. So the tyranny emerges and it destroys any threat that it might have. And it, and it destroys the threat, not because it's dealing rationally with the situation, it's dealing self-referentially. Yeah, situation. that's a great point. So I've seen, and, and 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 you've got the beginnings of that in Perlandra, yeah. Because in Perlandra, it's basically at Venus, the beginning of a, a of a new world. You've got the eve of that world, and and Ransom ends up on that planet, but also Weston, mm -hmm. who's the most nefarious character in all of Lewis's books. He he makes the White Witch look like That's children's right. play. Yeah, and he is so evil, so self-referential that he loses even the capacity to exhibit 
anything that approximates humanity. Yeah. And Lewis starts calling him in that book, the unman. Yes. Yeah. He's so evil and he, he shrivels up, he diminishes. He's a lot, a lot like the ghosts in the, in the great divorce. In that yeah. Book. Well, and I thought that was interesting too. And I wonder if this, if this follows Lewis's own journey, but in Out of the Silent Planet, um, Weston wants to conquer the whole universe for, for mankind. And he doesn't care what, what that looks like, even if mankind evolves and, and changes completely and looks completely different. He doesn't care. He just wants mankind's trajectory to keep going. And then in Paralandra, he's kind of, uh, his, his thinking has evolved from maybe an, an atheist conqueror of the universe to kind of a pantheist. Uh, and, and he says that at least. And then to this unman. And I think he eventually gets, does he get possessed by Satan, you think? Is yeah, that he right? possessed. Okay. He's possessed. And the possession is easy to go by because of his, his evil. Yeah, but the thing is, though, he's not trying to save things for mankind. That's yeah. just an excuse. Okay. He, he doesn't care about mankind. He cares about himself. Yeah. And he cares about basically what he thinks of mankind. He's an utter subjectivist. Yeah. And then even in that hideous strength, the group that he's a part of mm -hmm. is the NICE, the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments. So what do they do? They first begin experimenting on animals, mm -hmm. and then they want to start experimenting on people. Mark Studdock, who's caught in the balances, tries to get into the inner ring and then finds out the inner ring is vacuous. Yeah. Now he awakens to the fact that he's, he's in trouble. He sees that they're trying to use him. Uncle Andrew, in the magician's nephew, is mm -hmm. another guy who's experimenting on animals and then tries to uh, experiment on his nephew and his nephew's friend, Polly. And, and Lewis, Lewis is often used, his e most evil characters are always cruel to animals. Yeah, and he's got that essay vivisection where he talks about vivisecting animal, animals. Yeah. He had a special character. I've done, I've done lectures for the Humane Society US on this very thing. Hmm. The, the Lewis, Lewis, Lewis isn't like PETA where they talk about animal rights. Wouldn't, sure. Lewis wouldn't talk about animal rights because he would say animals don't have souls, they yeah. don't have rights. But humans have souls. And if humans treat their animals badly, yeah. human souls are diminished by yeah. their cruelty. And the cruelty and the inability to check my expression of evil towards the animals loses its capacity to contextualize and begins to also then begin to be cruel towards humans. Yeah. And, and it's very powerful, I think. Yes. Yeah. So that's, seen... that's also why in that hideous strength, here again is spoiler. Yeah. A spoiler alert in that hideous strength it's the animals that then in, in their sort of babylon or babel tower of babel kind of thing it's the animals who end up destroying the nice who are trying to destroy them yeah mr bultitude just goes yeah it's, it's it's a little bit of a you know you reap what you sow yeah i love that so I, i've noticed that you talked about how Lewis writes a proposition, sometimes writes a propositional story or a book, sorry, book, and then he'll put that into a narrative form. And I've seen even all those ideas or a lot of those ideas can be even traced back further into his essays. And so he's sure. got a vivisection that transfers out. He's got De Futilitate, which finds its culmination in uh, the book Miracles. And, and then for uh, the abolition of man, which finds its narrative form in uh, that he is strength can be traced back to the poison of subjectivism. Is that, do you think that's fair? I think that's all fair. And I think also too, and it's a good observation on your part, but I think also even in uh, his first book he wrote after he became a Christian was called uh, The Pilgrim's Regress, yeah. an allegorical apology for Christianity, reason, and romanticism. Mm -hmm. So he said in the Arthurian Torso, another one of the books we talked about in the neglected C.S. Lewis, that the first problem in life is how do you fit the stone in the shell? Yeah. And it's an image taken from Wordsworth's The Prelude for this Bedouin Shepherds. And he takes it from Charles Williams' Arthurian poetry, too, because they both use the same image. A, a, a uh, Bedouin Shepherds coming along with a stone, which represents reason, and a shell, which rep represents romantic longing. Hmm. How do you fit the stone in the shell, Lewis says, is the first problem in life? How do you fit good reason with the heart? Yeah. And usually we'll divorce one from the other. We see, we see this, I think, even in Christian circles right sure, now. Absolutely. If we, if we have a friend who's had an abortion, or if we have a friend who's struggling with same-sex attraction, our heart goes out to them, as it should. But we're ready to let our heart go out to them and let go of the reason. Or else we could have the reason 
and our heads are strong and so we don't have a heart for this person yeah instead of saying how can i have a heart for this person and not compromise the gospel right and that's going to take work to fit yeah. the stone in the shell and and we've got all kinds of people who have compromised what the scriptures have said because they have a friend and and they let the emotion take over jesus yeah. meets a woman caught in adultery and he loves her forgives her accepts her and says go your way and sin no more right he doesn't compromise it yeah so, so that's anyway, grace and truth would you would you could you align that I, with the i think grace and truth could go but that first book that lewis writes is the pilgrim's regress an allegorical apology for christianity reason and romanticism he saw christianity could bring the two together i don't okay. want to divorce the scriptures and the centrality of faith yeah. in order to solve some of these problems he holds them together yeah but that's also an allegorical autobiography mm -hmm. so later after he writes about it in imaginative form lewis writes um surprised by joy which is uh -huh. a more propositional approach to autobiography. yeah yeah that's great yes that, that he, he yeah that's awesome so jerry i wanted to finish up here with the abolition of man we've already uh, talked about it a little bit but uh this is a, a pretty short piece but it's its uh, impact has been huge. I, I know a lot of just cultural studies have had to take it up too because he makes great points. But this is something that you you analyzed in your uh, dissertation using Richard Weaver, uh, the great rhetorician uh, from yeah. Chicago. Um, can you can you explain that for us? Uh, that his, yeah. his arguments there. First off, too, I would say the abolition of man. Um, Mortimer Adler included in the great books of the Western world in the 1968 yeah. um, edition to the yeah. not e edition an edition okay. like you edit a book but yeah. addition addition so 1968 edition he included the uh, abolition of man wow. in the great books of the Western world so and Adler and his committees look at this book they put it up there with uh, Plato and Aristotle and Augustine Thomas Aquinas you know, and so on in this book, Lewis is concerned about this encroachment of subjectivism, mm -hmm. this encroachment of self-referentialism, this loss of objectivity. And by the way, some people, when they hear people talk about Lewis as an objectivist, they immediately project on him that he was an Enlightenment rationalist, yeah. which shows their own lack of understanding. Lewis was not an Enlightenment rationalist. His objectivity is like a magic from before the dawn of time. He goes back to ancient classics and to the scholastic era and so on. The, 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 the uh, Enlightenment rationalism begins with, uh, with people like Descartes, who, who turned his back on the epistemology, classical epistemology, which saw that because humans are fallen and finite, you have to have check and balance on our understanding. You have authority, reason, and experience. Mm -hmm. These three working in, in concert. Lewis writes about it in De Futilitate. He writes about it in Why I'm Not a, 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 a Pacifist and so on. He writes about it in The Discarded Image, the importance of having the checks and balances. So Leibniz comes on and says, uh, Descartes comes on and says, no, it's reason. Yeah. It's reason. So he breaks with tr tradition. And then and, and in reaction to it, Locke says, no, it's experience. You know, uh, uh, experience writes in a blank tablet and so on. Right. Lewis, Lewis rightly says, if if the mind is a blank tablet, then the mind remains a blank tablet even right. after the experience. Right. Just like you show a movie on a, on a screen and you turn the, the film off, the movie doesn't stay on the screen. Right. It's got to have receptors. It's got to have memory. It's got to have the capacity to sort with the superlative, big, bigger, biggest, and all that stuff. So anyway... Lewis's objectivity is deeper than that. And in the ob abolition of man, Lewis is arguing for that. He's arguing for what he calls the Tao, the mm -hmm. doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain things are really true and other things really false, the kind of thing we are and the kind of thing the universe is. Lewis says this is not Western thought. Yeah. This has been the core of sound thinking throughout time and throughout cultures and at the end of the discarded image he has an appendix where he brings up quotes from confucius from the buddhists from the hindus from the jews from the muslims and so on to show that wherever there's been some substantive thinking it has become it, it has started from this objectivity all yeah. those all those cultures just like our own culture can go off the rails mm -hmm. but nevertheless we see in the core literature, this understanding of objectivity is not 
enlightenment rationalism. Right. Okay, so the first chapter, basically, Lewis is trying to define what objective value is. He shows that the mistake of subjectivism, he uses several illustrations, forage at a waterfall where there's, the, the, you know, I don't have time to go into it probably now, yeah. but, but, but basically what he's doing is he's setting up a, a, an understanding and he sets it up by virtue of definition. Mm -hmm. The second chapter, he says, if you have people who are making judgments and they don't have objectivity, why would they be doing this and how? And he said, well, maybe it's something like this. And he gives us examples of, of, of possibilities of these things. The last chapter, he says, if you, if, if, if the third chapter of the book, if you reject objectivity, then what happens? And he says it will lead to the collapse of the entire culture and society and so on. So the second, the second one, is that an argument by analogy? No, the second one is, a, is an argument by similitude. Similitude. I think. And then so the what, third one is like a consequence, right? This is what Yeah. Going to your... So Richard Weaver, in his book, The um, uh, Ethics, the Ethics of Rhetoric, of Rhetoric yeah. Weaver is most known for his book, Ideas Have Consequences. Yeah, great he taught point. at the University of Chicago. But his book, The Ethics of Rhetoric, he sets out that there are four types of, of arguments. Mm -hmm. Uh, the most ethical is the argument from definition because it's something objective it's an ob object of thought i can go back if i go off the rails i can still trace myself back lewis says if you if you make a mistake you can't fix a mistake by continuing to go on you've got right. to go back and find out where you made the mistake so the argument from from um definition is what weaver says is the most ethical form because there's something there yeah but i can't always get to definition the word definition literally means of the finite. We define things by their limitation and their function. Anything has to be small enough for me to wrap words around it and distinguish it from other things if I'm going to define it. How then do you define God if he's infinite? Mm. So the scholastic philosophers and theologians understood this, and they talked about the way of analogy that, that we could say, well, God is like. Even Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, uses... Uh, uh, parables he says the kingdom of heaven is like right, yeah. so that's the second best form yeah best form is definition second best is similitude if i can't get to definition the worst form the most unethical form of argumentation is the argument of consequence okay if you vote for my opponent in this next election the whole country is going to go to hell in a handbasket how do i know that mm. i don't know so i'm arguing from nothing yeah and consequently, I'm trying to create fear in my hearer's mind and then uh, get them off the rails. Now, you can have some arguments. Lewis doesn't discuss these, but you can have some arguments uh, like history. And some of these can be arguments of consequence. Oh, you yeah. vote for that guy. He's Hitler. Yeah. Well, wait right. a minute. You know, he's not Hitler. You know, and so all of a sudden I try and create fear in you. Yeah. But you could have an argument from history. We've seen in the past examples where this has happened. And it's kind of worked out this way. It's good for us to be learning from history and right. learning from past errors. And, and that could be an argument from similitude. So it's just the argument from history is, is dicey. You've got to make sure you're defining how you mean this argument. But this argument from consequence is manipulative. Yeah. It seeks to create fear in people and it seeks to manipulate them. And then lastly, uh, Weaver talks about the argument from authority. Yeah. And this is when I don't know how to argue, so I just quote somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the people that do books like the quotable C.S. Lewis or something. <laughs> so, so when you go to the abolition of man, you actually see that kind of development throughout the book. The first chapter is hands down the strongest. Lewis is arguing from definition. Mm -hmm. Second chapter is an argument from similitude. Third chapter is an argument from consequence. He does a better job depicting it in fiction and that hideous strength than I think he does in the third chapter of the okay. evolution of man. And then the last chapter is the argument from authority. He says, look, this objectivity, it's out there. Let me just give you examples. And he gives example after example after example to help people think, to help people break free of the prejudice of thinking that Lewis is just arguing some sort of Western concept that right. marginalizes other cultures and so on. Yeah, I, I love how it fits so perfectly. And I've, I've talked with you before about this and whether that was intentional that Lewis, I mean, he, Lewis didn't read Richard Weaver, but- Weaver uh, read Lewis though. He wrote actually, Weaver wrote a, 
a literary critical uh, assessment of uh, studies and words. Oh, wow. Man, I'll have to look that up. So Weaver, Weaver liked Lewis. Okay. And Weaver died in 1963, the same year Lewis died, but we, Weaver was way, way younger than Lewis. He okay. In the early 50s. Wow. Maybe well, late 40s. So for anyone more interested in, in, uh, in getting into that, that cultural critique and the philosophy uh, and Lewis's arguments against subjectivism, you got to pick up Jerry's book, C.S. Lewis and the, and the Problem of Evil. It's an investigation of a per pervasive theme, and it's all about, Jerry, I'd say it's all about um, Lewis diagnosing evil as uh, self being self-referential, turning it on yourself like an ingrown hair. Self-referential, but also he said it in the poison, poison of subjectivism. He defines subjectivism yeah. and says that it, it can become the rationalization of any form of evil. Mm. But you can go to, you can see this in Aristotle too. By the way, in the abolition of man, Aristotle and Confucius are the two most quoted authors, mm. interestingly enough. Wow. But, but Aristotle understands that if I do something wrong, and I don't create uh, change my bad behavior. The only way I can live with myself is if I begin to rationalize yeah. the bad behavior and justify it. So <clears throat> Aristotle says vice is unconscious of itself. Mm. I lose the ability to see with moral clarity. Yeah. Uh, C.S. Lewis said in his preface to Paradise Lost, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Yes. And then Paul said in Romans 1, we suppress truth in our unrighteousness. Yeah, yeah I think that's great because I've, I've heard people argue, you know, there's some, there's some odd people out there, but they say, you know, Lewis was a heretic because he believed in this, in this Tao, this external moral. And it's like, well, that's, that's just Romans 1 and 2. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah exactly it's written right. on our heart. And exactly what you were saying, you know, I remember the first time I told a lie, I thought my parents where I thought they could read my mind. I thought they knew that I lied. They found out they're going to get me. When I realized they, they didn't find out, I didn't get in trouble for it, it became easier for me to lie. I started uh -huh. getting more scar tissue on my conscience, and that was easier to do. As I sinned more, I was suppressing, you know, and um, that's our conscience. And, you know, I think we, we need a new heart, right? God has to, we have to be born of, of spirit. He has to give us a new heart with new desires. But he still has given us this conscience, just like Romans 2 talks about. and we can still be held responsible for it. And Lewis just calls that the Tao. It's a little bit like Oscar Wilde's story about Dorian Gray, mm. who has the painting and every time he does something wrong, the painting he has of himself is, is um, uh, disfigured. Yeah. Until finally he realized having lived this life, he begins to see in the painting what he's really become. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and consequently though, you, you don't finish the loop on that understanding mm -hmm. until you then, rush to God for grace yeah. and forgiveness and restoration because you know that when you manage things yourself, you, you just mess up. The great thing about the gospel is that God loves us unconditionally. It's not based on our performance. Mm -hmm. He forgives us. I don't know a person who's lived a moment of honest life who fails to recognize they need forgiveness. And because our management has demonstrated our inability to hold things in balance, he also offers us in the gospel the willingness to enter into our life as Lord and begin the process of bringing order out of the chaos. Mm. I think that that's, that's marvelous stuff. Yeah, man. Amen. I love that. Jerry, this has been awesome. This is uh, we've, we've touched on a lot of different things. We could touch on even more. I hope sometime to have you on again. And, uh, and Parker, and Parker, more depth. God has been kind to us. Mm. We've, we've got enough history together that I can say to you, honestly, I love you, my brother. Mm, I love you, man. If I could ever serve you, I'm more than willing to do that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being so generous with your time. And uh, my audience is going to love this. They're, they're going to grow a ton. I feel like every time we meet, I level up. It's like taking a, a mushroom in, uh, in Mario Kart, and I'm starting to grow up. And it's, yeah. And be careful what, what you do with eating mushrooms. Now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right, brother. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again. This has been Parker's Pensies. Uh, we could talk about this more and someday we will, but for now, it's going to have to do it. Thanks.